Hi, this is Bartosz Miluski with the eighth installment of the C11 concurrency series. Today I want to talk about passing arguments to threads, and this will be my gentle introduction to message passing. I will also show you how to create a concurrency bug in an application and how to chase it down. Almost every time we create a thread, we have to pass it some initial arguments. And there are safe ways of passing these arguments and unsafe ways. And this is a general discussion that will also apply when we introduce message passing. Because passing messages is very similar to passing initial arguments to a thread. The same rules will apply. The simplest way of passing arguments is by value. And in most cases this is a very safe way because the thread gets a private copy of the arguments and it can do whatever it wants to it. Things get a little bit more complicated when the arguments are of non-trivial types which contain, let's say, pointers, references and so on internally. In that case, you have to make sure that both the copy constructor and the copy assignment do a good job of deep copying the contents of the object. The second way, which is very similar to passing by value, it's passing arguments by move, using move semantics. If you are dealing with larger objects, Sometimes passing by value may be too expensive, especially if you are passing containers. So passing by move is a cheaper way of, of doing the same. And again, you have to be careful when you are passing more complex objects to make sure that the move constructor and the move assignment do a good job of moving the internals of the object as well. Because if an object contains shared references, I mean references to shared data, then by moving this object you are creating aliases to this shared data. Passing by value and passing by move is safe because it doesn't introduce sharing. Passing by reference, on the other hand, introduces inter-thread sharing of data. And this is much more tricky. So there are two ways of passing by reference, const reference and non-const reference. Let's start with the const reference. When you pass data by const reference to a thread, this thread will not modify this data. So this is good, but it doesn't guarantee that the parent thread doesn't have write access to the data. So as soon as the parent thread starts writing into it in parallel, with our worker threads reading from it, you get a classical data race. To avoid this data race, you have to be careful and make sure that nobody has write access to the object. Such objects are called immutable. So it's safe to pass immutable objects by const reference. You also have to make sure that this immutability is deep, that an object that you are passing by const reference doesn't have any non-const references inside, because in C++, constness is shallow. It doesn't propagate through pointers or references inside the object. Now, if you are passing an object by non-const reference, then things are much more tricky. And the safe way of doing this, as I showed you in, in the previous installment, was to create monitor objects. A monitor object has its own mutex, and it guarantees that all public methods will take this mutex, will lock this mutex, so that the internals of the object will never be accessed by multiple threads at the same time. They will be just waiting for the mutex to be released and only then access it. 
The sharing of monitors is usually safe, but there are some pitfalls that you should be aware of. One such pitfall is composing monitors, when one monitor has access to another monitor and so on. You might easily get into deadlock situations. The other pitfall is when you start optimizing access to your monitors. And I will show you one such optimization that might work in most cases, but it sometimes is, is dangerous. And that's when the lifetime of a monitor can be divided into epochs. Let's go back to the example from the previous tutorial. We have a monitor object called result monitor, and it has a mutex inside, and every method takes a lock on this mutex, here and here and here. Now this result monitor, for some part of its lifetime, is used by a single thread, and at other times it's accessed by multiple threads. So its lifetime is divided into epochs, which are single-threaded and multi-threaded. Here's a single-threaded function, list tree, that is the driver for the multi-threaded part of the program. When it starts, it has exclusive access to this result monitor called result, and it calls two methods on it. One is isDearsEmpty and the other is getDears. And then the multi-threaded part starts when it calls async in a loop. And here it's passing the result by reference. So from this point on result is shared between threads. And at this point, in this loop here, we are forcing all the futures, which forces the threads to finish. So after that moment, after this barrier, there is again on the single thread accessing result. And then we go into the loop and again call is dears empty and get dears in a single threaded manner. And here's an, a diagram that illustrates it. So we start in the epoch that is single-threaded, the result monitor is private, and the methods we call is isDearsEmpty and getDears. Then we go into multi-threaded epoch, where the monitor is shared, and we call putDear and putFile. Then we go again into single-threaded epoch, and so on, and so on. And notice one thing. The methods that are called in the multi-threaded epoch are put dear and put file. And there are methods that are only called in the single threaded epoch. And that's is dears empty and get dears. So these methods that are called always in the single threaded epoch, they don't really need a protection from multiple threads. So we could, in principle, remove the locks from these methods. So let's do it. This is the is dears empty method. Let's get rid of the lock here. And here's the get dears method. Let's get rid of the lock here too. And let's see the program. Uh, this is the list tree function, which has these epochs of sing single threadedness. And this is the main function, just creates the monitor. Uh, puts the starting directory in it and then calls list tree with the result with the reference to the result so we see that this is single threaded this program compiles and runs without any problems this program is correct several months or maybe years pass by a new programmer is hired and he looks at this code and says, hey, we have so many cores in our processors nowadays. I bet I can improve the performance of this program by calling list tree in multiple threads. We'll parallelize this. Okay? And by the way, it's safe because we are passing it a monitor. 
and passing monitors by reference remember is safe all right so let's start immediately auto some future equals sdd async and um, the address of our function which is called list tree and a reference std ref of result okay now we need another thread let's just try two threads to begin with and I'll bet the improvement will be a hundred percent okay now we have to wait for these things right so let me put weights here okay and also I want to pre-fill my uh, paths so I'll just list the top level uh, directory and prefill my results with these top level paths. Okay, so it's a directory iterator, I pass it a path, and I iterate and I push the directories to my result so that uh, asynchronous list tree can pick these directories and use them all right so this is my new program and of course it compiles and runs and bang something goes wrong oh this is not good we are getting some weird errors and now this oh uh, this is a breakpoint inside free which means the heap is corrupt let me finish it and of course the debugger won't help us very much here of course in this case we know what the problem is our monitor is not really a monitor because we made some clever optimizations and uh, these optimizations were okay as long as list tree was called only from a single thread we broke this assumption and now we have a data race. Finding and debugging data races is really hard because they depend on a particular timing of threads which is hard to reproduce. And in our cases you've seen the error that we got was heap corruption. And heap corruption is detected much later than the data race that caused it. There are tools that are specifically designed for detecting and uh, debugging data races. I happen to have one such tool installed on my machine because I work for the company that makes it. It's called Jinx. Here's the panel. And I can start it directly from the debug menu. And we'll see if it can help us find the bug in our program start debugging with Jinx. Jinx inserts little simulations while the program is running trying to find thread interleavings that cause a data race. The counters here show me how many simulations were done and how many of them involve actual data sharing. Generate report will create an HTML file that is now open in the browser. There are many data races in the program. Most of them are benign data races in the Windows DLLs. But the ones in the beginning here are the, are the ones of interest. So a data race is between two threads. One thread was in get dears, another thread was in list dear. Um, there's another race between get dears and list dear, and there was another one between list dear and list tree. So let's look at one of them. 
let's expand it, it shows the stack trace and it shows the source code so it was indeed in get dears here and was calling result dears empty so access to result was shared and it shouldn't have been and we can look at the other thread that raced with the first one and this one was in list dear in this line result put dear so these two threads were accessing result at the same time and they raced against each other so now that we know where to look for the race, we go back to the source code and fix it very easily.